15 individuals honored in the second edition of Portrait Awards. ECOWAS countries that failed to sign EPA by 1st October to be denied access to EU markets. Good evening, it's time for news uh, live on GBC24 and GTV. I'm Suyoko Kakutre. And I am Micheline Taka. You welcome to the news. The Supreme Court has ordered the Electoral Commission to submit in writing the full list of persons who used NHI's cards to register for the voters' ID card. The EC is also to furnish the court in writing with steps it has put in place to comply with the court's orders to claim the current voters' register in compliance with the Constitution. The court gave the EC up to the 29th of this month to comply with its orders. The five-member panel of judges chaired by the Chief Justice Georgina Wood said the orders given are in person or to Article 2 of the Constitution. The Supreme Court gave the orders in respect of an application filed by a former national youth organizer of the PNC, Abu Ramadan, in May, seeking clarification and further directions on the court's judgment on his suit, challenging the credibility of the current voters' register. Today marks 10 years since the Persons with Disability Act was passed. Its enactment gave equal access and opportunities to persons with disabilities or PWDs in Ghana. In Parliament on Thursday, lawmakers were in agreement that Ghana can still make life more meaningful for such persons if gaps in the law are addressed. We can and should institute for the employment of persons with disability in the public sector and provide tax and other incentives for the private sector to employ more qualified PWDs. Our country and our educational system must begin to take serious steps to put in measures to help educate individuals with autism who have been proven around the world that if given proper education, they are not only very intelligent, but they can be very constructive members of society. I really do not think that people who are disabled are calling for sympathy or empathy, but they are calling for fairness, they are calling for justice, so that they can also live comfortably, like those of us who, by the creation of the same Allah, are very comfortable, we can move around, we can do certain things without much difficulty. The maker of the statement praised the uh, parliament for creating disability-friendly facilities at the new block at Job C. Sandrick. But Mr. Speaker, even the entrance to this very block we find ourselves in lack that facility. The building within which we enacted the law. So I think where they say charity begins at home. Let's also try to do whatever we can to also make entry to this block disability friendly. The Minister for Education, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajiman, mentioned June 29, 2016, as the date for the reconstitution of the Council for the University of Education, Winneba. This was in response to a question from the Member of Parliament for Efutu, Mr. Alexander Kwamina Afenyo Markin. Meanwhile, some persons living with disability have expressed concern about the lack of political will to enforce the Act, which clearly spells out all inclusiveness and equal opportunities for all. Understand the whole of this building, there's no any elevator to carry me to came here. They just want to carry me like a, a sack of coal. Why? Do you see what of what of that is? This is an emotionally disturbed Ghanaian para athlete, Mr. Patrick Obin, who recently won the Best Swag Para Athlete Awards but had to be carried to the event grounds upstairs because the building was not disability friendly. The Persons with Disability Bill was passed to promote the rights of PWDs in Ghana. 
Sections of the law make it mandatory for all buildings and public facilities to be made accessible to PWDs. However, many buildings are not disability compliant. Ten years on, I, I still come across a lot of the public buildings that are still not um, still not accessible. There are a lot of the ministries that are still difficult to get to. When this bill was passed, or when it became an act uh, ten years ago, the idea was we're going to give ten years so that by this time, by this time, a lot of these things would have been brought into conformity with the law. Unfortunately, it seems like there was just a standstill. One of the sustainable development goals is to promote inclusiveness at all levels for PWDs. Teachers lack the capacity to identify children with special needs because of lack of resources to train them in that regard. We are helpless. We do, we do not really know how to deal with people with disability. Even the smallest form of disability, we cannot even identify that in the classroom. Very few teachers have been trained to do that. There's a need for many more teachers to be able to identify these children wherever they are so that they too can be given the opportunities that other children have. Many Ghanaians praise President Mahama for including a PWD, Mr. Henry Seydou Dana, in his government as Minister for Chieftaincy and Traditional Affairs. Mr. Seydou Dana says, with the right environment, persons with disability can contribute their quota to national development. Discrimination, it's, it kills, not just individuals, but even the nation. Because when you, you rob Ghana of certain talents, God-given talents, that could have benefited the nation. Ten years after the passage of the bill, persons living with disability are calling on all to comply with the law and respect their rights in society. Fifteen individuals who distinguished themselves in their respective fields of endeavor have been honored in the second edition of the Portrait Awards in Accra. The focus of the event this year was on industri industrialists who have broken barriers to make significant contributions towards job creation in the country. The Lifetime in a Portrait Award is an initiative of the Initiators of Change Foundation. The award is aimed at recognizing individuals from varied backgrounds who have impacted society positively. The first edition of the award was dedicated to all former presidents and heads of state, two international statesmen and three Ghanaian women achievers. This year, the spotlight was on captains of industries. The award winners are Dr. Kweku Otin, Chief Executive of Angel Group of Companies, Mr. Nick Danswege, President, Link International Holdings Limited, Dr. Kweju Safo, Founder, Great Kosa Networks of Companies, Mrs. Justina Beidu, CEO, Adam Group of Companies, and Dr. Kwame Che, Chairman, Unity Group of Companies. The rest are Dr. Ose Kwame Despite, Chairman, Despite Group of Companies, Madam Belinda Akofo, CEO, Linda Dog Group of Companies, Dr. Kweku Fempon, CEO, Champion Group of Companies, Mr. Seti Abua, CEO, Yorks Investment Limited, Madam Monica Onhine Opari, Founder, Golden Sunbeam International School, Mr. Danso Abiam, Chairman, Abiam Group of Companies, Mrs. Betty Champo, CEO, Hollywood Group of Companies, Dr. Samuel Amu Tobin, Chairman, Tobinko Group of Companies, Dr. Joseph Siang Ejepon, Executive Chairman, Jospon Group of Companies, and Alhaji Dr. Asuma Banda, CEO, Antrak Group of Companies. According to the Executive Director of the Initiators of Change Foundation, Mr. Kofi Jan, the award is a 20 by 30 inch raw pencil portrait of the recipient. It was drawn by Mr. Imrana Abdurrahman. The Minister for Public-Private Partnership, Mr. Rashid Pelpo, commended these industry players who have partnered government to raise the standards of living of Ghanaians. Some of the award winners spoke to GBC24. Never give up. Continue. No matter what the situation, you will fight to the end. All the youth must focus on how much you can offer 
your help to others than asking for you know how much you can pay me because as soon as you say how much can you pay me that is your worth a book that details the milestones of the award winners was launched mr rashid pelpo bought the first copy of the book at 20,000 ghana cities for gbc 24 winifred the fool an agricultural program dubbed slow foods 10,000 gardens in Africa project has been launched at Amasaman in the Greater Accra region. The project aims at promoting food security through gardening. Mrs. Matilda Emisa Arthur revealed that the program will complement and sustain the school feeding program. Agriculture in the sub region, particularly Ghana, is considered by many as non profitable due to challenges in the sector. To ensure food security and encourage more people to go into farming, a number of projects have been initiated in the country by the government and some non-governmental organizations. One such organization is Slow Food Foundation. Slow Food is an international association started in 1989 and is active in over 160 countries across the world. It has a membership of about 100,000. The national coordinator of Slow Food Ghana, Mr. Philip Amwa, said the group believes that food must be devoid of toxic components, while its production and distribution must also be environmentally friendly. When we buy our local food, we help the local farmers, which in turn help to build Ghana as a whole. Since food is also linked to us culturally, when we lose our local food system, we will lose most of our culture. The local food system has to be healthy in the sense that there should be linkages, short linkages between producers and consumers. And so we are promoting the farm-to-table concept where people can be able to see who is producing their food, how their food is being produced. The Slow Foods 10,000 Gardens in Africa project, now launched in Ghana, focuses on the role of gardens in the food production chain. It also supports the Ghana School Feeding Program in achieving its third objective of boosting domestic food production. Currently, Slow Food Ghana has 45 gardens in the country. The wife of the Vice President, Mrs. Matilda Emisa Arthur, emphasized the importance of the school feeding food chain. The policy that set up the school feeding program, the diagram draws a chain where the food is grown locally and it's sold to the women who prepare the food. And the arrangement is that for every locality, foods that are grown in that locality should be used. First, to help the local producers. Secondly, to ensure that the produce is fresh and clean. Thirdly, to ensure that the children eat healthy and nutritious foods. And lastly, to ensure that we minimize absenteeism, we minimize um, health issues, and we ensure that children stay in school. She advised that vegetables and other foods be cooked in a manner that the nutrients are preserved. She was later presented with a book and a customized apron. Meanwhile, three book stories to warm your hearts, pearls of wisdom, and nuggets for victorious living have been launched in Accra, authored by Kofi Otutue Dulabi. The three Christian literature are about life experiences, the wisdom of God, and successful Christian lifestyle. The wife of the Vice President, Mrs. Matilda Emisata, who launched the books, described them as a wealth of knowledge presented in an interesting, inspirational, and educative way that makes them worth reading. The launch was done at the Victory Congregation of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana at Farfaha near Dodua in the Greater Accra region. Stories to Warm Your Heart is a compilation of some of the author's fondest memories of events, places and people, stories in books, advice and wisdom in the Word of God. In the Pearls of Wisdom, the author introduces his readers to the secret of success, the fear of God and the search for wisdom, as well as wise sayings gathered from various sources including poets, lawyers, surveyors, historians, motivational speakers, pastors and footballers. Nuggets for Victorious Living also serves as a devotional 
that relates the word of God to a wide range of things such as courage, waiting on the Lord, the value of silence, generosity, faith, humility, wisdom, and being Christ-like, all interlaced with Presbyterian hymns. The author, Mr. Kufi Otutu Edulabi, is a legal and administration consultant and currently the chairman of Beige Capital and an elder in the Presbyterian Church of Ghana. He says it is his prayer to see young people get nurtured through his books. These three books will find their way to young people in particular will learn many useful and uplifting principles and values to guide them. To God alone be the glory. The wife of the vice president, Mrs. Matilda Misa Arthur, edited all the three books. She described the effort of the author as revealing, inspiring, and worth reading. I edited those books. I tore the books apart, but I learned a lot. There were things I read about Ephraim Amo that I didn't know. There were things I read about Denzel Washington that I didn't know. And I urge all the parents here to buy copies for their children. Step Publishers published the books. Part of the proceeds from the sale of the books would be donated to charity. Theodora Medeto, GBC24, Accra. You're still watching News Are Live on GBC24 and GTV. Hello again, my name is Maurice Ogbeto, we'll do business live on GBC24. Now, effective FEX October 2016, ECOWAS member countries that have not signed the Economic Partnership Agreement will be denied access to the EU market. According to the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Madam Hannah Tete, countries that fail to sign the EPA will be denied duty-free and quota-free access to the EU market. The Economic Partnership Agreement, EPA, is a trade agreement which allows ECOWAS countries 100% access to the EU market, whilst the EU gets 75% access. West African countries, for example, have had access to the European market for all commodities except arms. 14 countries, including Ghana, have already initialed the interim agreement. It is only Nigeria that still has issues with the EPA. Under the agreement as it stands, infant industries and products from the West African sub-region will be protected and enjoy duty-free and quota-free access to the EU market. The EPA is also expected to build the capacity of state institutions, for example, Ghana Standards Authority and laboratories in the various entry points in the sub-region to ensure that exports from the ECOWAS to the EU market meet the required standard. At the latest forum, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Ms. Hannah Tete, said, Exporters and suppliers in the country will lose out if Ghana fails to sign the agreement by 1st October 2016. As at now, we are not in a position to conclude an ECOWAS EPA. And so the fallback position, if we choose to take it, is an interim economic partnership agreement. Failing that, the businesses that export to the European Union will only be able to access the EU market on the basis of the general system of preferences. The implications are there also for the companies that supply to the companies that are exporting. Because if your main customer is no longer in business, then of course that basically is going to affect your business. The EU ambassador to Ghana, Dr. William Hanna, said the date for signing the agreement will no longer be extended. Middle-income countries will want to move to, to a relationship which is based on trade and investment and creating jobs rather than a, a relationship of the past which is based on aid. We're, we're moving forward. So we have to treat all countries around the world in a, in a similar way or else we could be uh, criticised by the World Trade Organization. So that, that's the dilemma we have. That's why we, have, that's why we can't change the, the dates. That's why we extended for a, for a two-year period. The rest of the discussions were held behind closed doors. Beatrice Senaju, GPC 24, Accra. And so Nigeria and the Gambia are yet to sign 
the economic partnership agreement Ghana has already signed. Now, the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority, SADA, is developing a roadmap for the transformation of the SADA ecological zone. The roadmap calls for strong policies and initiatives to facilitate the transformation agenda for the zone. The Northern Savannah Ecological Zone has been identified as the country's untapped economic reservoir with immense agronomic resources. The zone has about 8 million hectares of arable agricultural land that could trigger the economic transformation of Ghana and the sub-region. The zone is said to be fertile enough to produce abundant grain and rice to feed the whole country as well as exports to the rest of the sub-region. According to the SADA authorities, the zone has the potential to produce enough tomatoes to meet the country's need, with these commodities alone representing over $400 million of annual savings to the country's foreign exchange reserves. Despite these huge resources and benefits to be derived from the SADA zone, the sector still grapples with challenges, including the lack of long-term financing, poor infrastructure such as irrigation systems and road networks, and lack of improved seeds and fertilizer supplies to farmers. At a meeting in Accra, stakeholders and agricultural experts sought to develop a roadmap to address and help direct the right investment into the SADA zone. The roadmap will also ensure the development of agriculture and water transportation to link production centers to markets, develop modern agro-business processing industries, and enhance the supply chain of key products. The leader of the Ghana Strategy Programme at IFPRI, Dr. Shashi Kalavila, outlined a number of steps that need to be taken to transform the SADA zone. There is potential to develop agriculture, so that with that confidence, the share of, of budget going into agriculture, particularly in the SADA zone, needs to be increased. Uh, apply free trade zone strategic areas in SADA zone for agriculture production and, and, and processing, establish industrial zones with guaranteed access to power and transport, create differential tariffs for power for agriculture and irrigation. The chief executive of the Savannah Accelerator Development Authority, SADA, Mr. Charles Abugui, said the authority is working with the relevant stakeholders to make the transformation of SADA zone a reality. We have to become advocates in government for the things that are necessary for change to happen in the SADA zone. All of this requires capacity. And as a young institution, if we do all realize that this role is important, then we, our appeal is, please help us to build the institution for which we would like to see drive the agenda that we would like to shape. The directors of SADA say the roadmap will be scaled down to specific investment areas for investors to take advantage of the zone. And still in business, operators and policymakers in the utilities sector on the continent are to meet in Accra in July on ways to improve the continent's power sector. The annual general meeting of the Association of Power Utilities of Africa offers a platform to exchange ideas and seek ways to pool resources for effective energy generation, transmission and distribution. The Association of Power Utilities of Africa was created to promote development and integration of African power systems through interconnection of networks, exchange of experiences and know-how as well as pooling of resources in a win-win approach for members. APWA has a vision of becoming the primary catalyst for the realization of access to electricity for all the people of Africa. The vision revolves around five strategic axes, the capacity building and funding of member companies, promoting energy efficiency and renewable energy, rural electrification and South-South cooperation, repositioning APWA and new strategy, as well as reframing the coordination of the power pools in Africa. Chief Executive Officer of VRA, Mr. Ke Kofi, said addressing challenges of access to electricity is high on the agenda. Today, even though 600 million people in this continent don't have access to electricity, I believe 50 years ago, even though the population was not that, a larger percentage of the people did not have access. 
50 years ago, we didn't have regional power pools. Today, we have regional power pools. A few of them. I mean, we have one in West Africa, East Africa, and then uh, Southern Africa. Today, as we speak today, as we speak right now, about close to 200 megawatts of electricity is being transported from Ivory Coast to us, as we speak right now. Because off peak, they have some supply generation. We also supply power to Togo Beni, including Burkina Faso. We have Netco here supplying a lot of power to the neighboring countries in uh, Ivory Coast, as well as uh, Burkina Faso. So there are a lot of achievements by this. I know APWA, I know some of my colleagues who have been attending a lot of meetings on these APWA meetings every year. A lot of ideas have been shared among ourselves. The Director General of APWA, Mr. Abel Didier Teller, said the conference will also focus on how to scale up renewable energy in Africa. The aim is to combine, to interconnect the Ghana gas with the Nigeria gas. That will be the strength. And we are working together. And not forgetting that Africans have some gas. So if you can connect Africa to Ghana, Ghana to Nigeria in terms of gas, that would be very a good achievement. That is where we are targeting to, to, to be. So if we have problem in the eastern part, that will flow with the western part. So that we, we will have strength. The association was founded in 1970 as the first continental group of power utilities to pull efforts for the integration of the African power sector. Let's go to the bank market where the city gained a peso to the US dollar to trade at 3 cities 80 pesos. The local currency gained 23 pesos to the pound sterling to sell at 5 cities 50 pesos. The city also gained 5 pesos to the euro to sell at 4 cities 34 pesos. And on the international commodities market, light crude appreciated by 34 cents to trade at $50.90 per barrel. However, gold and cocoa dipped by $4.80 and $3 to trade at $1,265.70 and $3,192 respectively. <music> In insurance news tonight, Managing Director of First Bank Financial Services, Samuel Esiedu, has tipped the three components of the National Pension Scheme as an investment portfolio that can serve as a source of funding for the informal sector. He explains that the Tier 3 has a savings component that can become available after five years of contributing to the scheme. Um, the first one we call the savings account. And then the second one is the retirement um, scheme so for example if i am a dressmaker i'm allowed to um, use 35 percent of my income let's say 100 ghana city then it means 30, 35 ghana city can go into my pensions then again under the 35 ghana city i can decide to put say 15 city in a savings account and then 20 city into my retirement account now the 15 CD in the savings account, under the law, the act, 
because it's a savings account, it allows that after five years, if I am in difficulty or I need money to inject into my business by order of capital, I can fall on the accumulation of the 15 CD in the savings account. The law allows withdrawal after five years of the funds in the savings account that has been provided by people in the info. And that was insurance news brought to you by SIC Live. The news continues. It is brought to you by kindness of FPAC. FPAC, it blows your pain away. Seven year old Elisha Boni needs 4,500 Ghana CDs to undergo two surgeries in his right arm at the Reconstructive Plastic Surgery and Burns Center at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. The mother of Elisha is appealing to the general public for financial assistance to help his son undergo the surgeries and join his mates back in school. Elisha has been on admission at the Reconstructive Plastic Surgery and Burns Center of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital for two months. He sustained the injury in his forearm after he was electrocuted trying to switch on an electric fan. The electrocution left the bones in his right arm fractured and some of his fingers and the wrist paralyzed. Florence Boni, Elisha's mother who is a petty trader, has to spend 1,000 Ghana cities every week for the dressing of the wound and its accompanying medication. She finds it difficult to foot the bills. Doctors have performed a decompression procedure to release the pressure in the arm to prevent a total loss of sensation in the fingers. Dr. Elliot Boham explained that Elisha requires two surgeries, release procedure to free the stiffened wrist and arms and a skin grafting surgery for him to have a full functioning of the arm. We had to do a procedure to release the pressure in the forearm, otherwise we're going to lose the whole of the, of the fingers. Current problems are that um, he would need a couple of surgeries more to cover up where we did the release, the decompression, and um, some form of exercises also. The cost of surgery is 4,500 Ghana cities. Florence is appealing to Ghanaians to support her son financially to undergo the two surgeries. <laughs> Donations for Elijah's surgery should be made in the name of the Reconstructive Plastic Surgery and Burns Center of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital or to the mobile money number account 0243-133-354. No amount is too small. Majority of the over 500,000 recorded cases of malaria and its related deaths per year are in Africa, that is, according to a statistics from the World Health Organization. Most of these deaths occur among children under age 5. To reduce this trend, the University of Ghana Malaria Center of Excellence is directing research efforts into finding a vaccine for malaria that will strengthen Ghana's capacity to eliminate the disease. Although there has been a global decline in malaria cases over the past decade, malaria is still the number one cause of illness in Ghana, accounting for 38.1% of OPD attendance, 27% of admissions and 7% of deaths in 2015. Children between 1 and 5 years, pregnant women and the aging are at the greatest risk. The research by the University of Ghana Malaria Center of Excellence to get a vaccine for malaria is an elimination measure, a departure from the hesitant control measure that involves the use of treated nets, drugs and the like. The deputy program manager of the National Malaria Control Program, Dr. Kezia Malm, said her outfit is working assiduously to hasten the country's malaria control process from control to elimination by the year 2020. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Ernest Aite, said about $5 million will be channeled into the research for the malaria vaccine. The university will be putting lots and lots of money into uh, malaria research. I do expect that us we begin to get results from the first million, more and more will be put into it. 
I have always spoken about uh, five million dollars in five years equals a, a vaccine. You know, the idea behind having this center is to also foster discussion and debate. The WHO country representative, Dr. Owen Laws Kalua, was enthused about the strategic shift in the battle against malaria and pledged the WHO's support to help eliminate malaria in Africa. Malaria prevention and control are now going towards elimination is one of the main priorities for the World Health Organization. Indeed, that was the case within the context of the Millennium Development Goals or MDGs and will remain or still remains so in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. Malaria affects adults and children of school-going age, which leads to lower productivity and loss of lives.